Hi everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and today we are going to do a fun color triangle exercise to play with color mixing of three primary colors of jacquard acid dyes on mini skeins of yarn. This is a really great exercise for playing with color mixing and understanding the relative potency of the various colors. So that way you know and you want to go make your perfect green what proportion of blue to yellow you might want to start with. This exercise is included in Knit Crate and Dyer Supplier's new Dive Into Dyeing course, which features some videos by me on how to dye yarn, how to set up dye stocks, and more. I'm really excited to have collaborated with them on this kit and to have filmed some awesome videos that will be featured on the Knit Crate YouTube channel. This video is not sponsored by Knit Crate or Dyer Supplier, but I was really excited to give this part of the course a shot since I hadn't done it before. I am an affiliate with both Knit Crate and Dyer Supplier, and you can find my links down in the video description. Uh, what an affiliate link means is that I earn a commission for any purchases made through my links on either of these websites. Now, a tiny bit more information before we go get started. We are using acid dyes today, which work on protein-based yarn, wool, alpaca, silk, things like that, and I will be using a superwash wool nylon blend today. Since I will be using dry acid dye powder today, safety is really important, and I will be wearing a rubber respirator mask whenever I am dealing with the powder, safety glasses, and gloves. Once I started mixing the powder with water and all the jars are closed, then I will remove my mask and proceed uh, with just gloves. The mask that I use is a deluxe rubber respirator that has P100 filters on it. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you have appropriate equipment when you're dealing with dry powders because you don't want to risk inhaling any particles. And now, Let's go get started. This exercise is going to involve mixing three primary colors, uh, Jacquard Bright Yellow, Brilliant Blue, and Fire Red together in 15 different combinations. And what this kind of exercise will help you do is understand the relative potency between each of the colors. And so then it's a great starting point to know if I wanna mix a true grass green what ratio of yellow to blue might I need? In addition to the dye, some vinegar, and yarn, for this project you'll need 15 small containers, uh, so that way we can set up each of these projects. You could use mason jars, or I'm gonna use some plastic takeout containers, but setting it up all at once is part of what's useful. And then finally, you'll need something to measure out small volumes of liquid. And I recommend some syringes so that way we can accurately measure the volumes. I'm using all three for increased precision when it comes to measuring out the volumes, but, but you could use the 10 mil for all of the measurements. I also highly recommend you get a digital kitchen scale. These are amazing to have because it is a lot more accurate to weigh out your dyes based on weight than it is on volume by say using a measuring spoon. So as we go through our triangle, on one side it'll be a mix of yellow and blue, then blue and red, and red and yellow, and then in the middle we'll have some combinations of all three colors. All of these proportions and formulas are based on dyeing 10 gram mini skeins at a 1% depth of shade, where there is an equivalent of one gram of dye per 100 grams of yarn. You can expand the triangle more, so that way you can have more proportions in there and more combinations of mixing all three of the colors together. Um, but this exercise of 15 is a great place to start. And finally, you don't need to use yellow, blue, and red. You could also do, say, a yellow, cyan, and magenta combination as well and compare those results to each other. Now we need to start setting up. And the first thing that we're gonna do is make some 1% stock solutions of each of our three colors. 
I recommend mixing your stocks uh, on the same day that you want to do this exercise because some colors behave a little differently in stock solution. They might crash out a little bit and not be mixed as well. And so if you want to use this to make recipes for the future or anytime you want really accurate results, I recommend mixing your stocks and using them as close to when you need them as possible. Today we are going to mix a 500 milliliter 1% stock solution of each of the three colors. And so we will start by measuring out five grams of dye and then dissolving it into 500 milliliters of total volume. We will start by adding some really hot water to our powder, getting that powder all nice and wet, and then slowly adding more and more liquid, stirring thoroughly until we hit the final volume of 500 milliliters. Don't forget that all of the tools and equipment we are using today are dedicated for dyeing yarn and are never used for food. This exercise only involves 10 milliliters of dye in each of the samples, and so we only need a total of 150 milliliters of dye, but I am making more because I have some other projects I would like to use this dye for later on. Once I've finished mixing the dye, I will transfer it into a storage bottle but don't forget to label your bottles with the color, the concentration, and the date. And again, a 1% concentration is one gram of dye per 100 milliliters of total volume. And so we have five grams of dye in 500 milliliters, and that's our 1% stock. Of these three particular colors, the Brilliant Blue dissolves fairly easily. The Fire Red might solidif start to solidify a little bit if you leave the volume of water a little too low, but it will dissolve with warm water. And the Bright Yellow has a tendency to clump up a little bit, so with some extra stirring you can get it dissolved. But uh, some of these little tips you will see from experience and learn as you go along. We now have 15 cups and each of them have one cup of plain tap water. There's no acid in here yet. I'm gonna add the acid after I add the yarn, but first we are gonna add the color. And in these three cups right here, I just aliquoted some of our 1% stock solutions we made, so that way it's a little easier for me to measure out the dye. And now, starting with our 10 milliliters of yellow, we are gonna add our colors into each of these cups. The triangle is really nicely laid out because as you go down each row, the volume changes, starting at 10 milliliters, seven and a half milliliters, five, then two and a half, and then zero. And so this made it really easy to get into a rhythm to add the colors to the containers, doing one at a time, starting with yellow, and then blue, and then finally red. With these proportions, there will be 10 milliliters of dye in each container, but you could modify this in many ways, and you could double all of the volumes, so you could examine 2% depths of shade, which would be two grams of dye per 100 grams of yarn. Or another way to think about the math is if maybe you had 20 gram mini skeins instead of 10 gram mini skeins that you wanted to use, then by doubling the amount of dye and doubling amount of yarn, by doubling the amount of dye and doubling the amount of yarn, you're keeping those ratios and proportions the same. So 20 milliliters of dye to 20 grams of yarn is the same here as if we were to have 10 milliliters of dye to 10 grams of yarn. One other thing to note is that if you are going to be using the same syringes for all three colors, make sure you wash them in between so you aren't introducing more color in than what you are intending to introduce. Here we are with our triangle and it's honestly hard to make a lot of conclusions from it at the moment. For one, things aren't really mixed, and two, I would say everything except for the red and yellow edge and then this blue looks really, really similar. But we should start getting a better sense of these hues once we add our yarn. But first, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and quickly um, mix all these up off camera, uh, making sure to 
rinse the spoon before going into each color. Today we will be using 15 10 gram micro skeins of wool to die for is Sheila's titanium, which is 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon. If you want to make your own 10 gram mini skeins, I recommend winding your yarn into a center pull yarn cake or even a hand wound ball and then weighing it at regular intervals. Um, so as you're winding your mini skeins, you can weigh the cake and then, you know, snip it when you get to 90 grams, 80 grams and things like that. Um, that's the way I tend to do it when I am making my own minis. I have pre-soaked this yarn in some plain tap water with no vinegar for a couple of hours. And now we are ready to add our yarn. I gently squeezed out most of the water from the mini skein so that way they would be damp but not dripping. And I'm gonna add them to these center cups first because those are the ones I'm the most curious about. Right now, they are very similar in being fairly reddish and purplish. Um, so, huh, that, looking at that tells me that maybe all of these colors are gonna skew a bit more red. But we're gonna add <laughs> these minis to the cups one at a time. And if it turns out that these colors skew really red, then that tells us hey, maybe you don't want to start with a one-to-one -one ratio of these two colors. Maybe if I want a really, really good orange, I'm gonna need to use just a tiny bit of red in with my orange. And just having done that row, that is what I would conclude here. And you could also play with this by starting with, say, less red. So make a 0.5% stock solution of your red uh, and then try this same exercise. You don't have to start with the 1% exactly. It looks like the yellow and blue are a lot more balanced. Right in here I see a teal, a green, and a more apple-y green. Let's see, this looks like, ooh, that's a beautiful purple. But notice, yeah, there's a lot more blue in that one. Um, so I would say the red is looking at the most potent here. I'm gonna go get a spoon so we can mix things up a little bit better. The red in here is going, it has the biggest impact. Um, this next one, which I think was seven and a half milliliters of yellow and just 2.5 milliliters of red is still fairly red versus being orange. And so now you know when you want to go and mix that orange color, uh, start here or maybe add a, you know, even less red and have just as much yellow. I am not rinsing the spoon as I go from these colors away from the yellow because I know that the blue is a bit more pigmented um, in each one. And so that's why I am comfortable going in this direction. And then likewise for our red. Ooh, this purple right here is beautiful. It's a nice, fairly dusty purple. A lot of these intermediates aren't that bright. And so if you wanted the colors to be a little brighter, then I think doing the cyan, magenta, uh, yellow combination might be really useful. Let's see here, we've got another, this is a fairly dusty purple, but a little more pinkish. This one, which is mostly yellow, I think it's two parts yellow, one part red, one part blue. This is the closest to a brown that we have in here so far. And then finally, ooh, that's a really nice sort of mauve tone in here. And this one is two parts red and one part of the other colors. So I think that this is beautiful. Goodness, the yarn isn't even dry yet, and we already have a ton of information right here. 
Now, what I'm gonna do at this point is I think I'm gonna leave everything like this to sit for about an hour. My goal today is to do a more cool vat technique and that will let the dye really slowly absorb to the yarn so we have a little bit more of a semi-solid appearance. There will still be some tonal variation, but we'll get more even cover color coverage this way by letting the colors absorb slowly, and plus it enables us to dye multiple different samples really easily at the same time. So I'll be back in about an hour to add some vinegar and then close all of these up. I am now going to add one teaspoon of white vinegar to each of the containers. This is between equivalent to between two to three tablespoons of white vinegar in eight cups of water. So it is a reasonable proportion. Then after I add all of this, I am now going to carefully stir things up. Um, but I would say we probably have some color starting to strike already with very little acid. My tap water does run slightly acidic, um, so that's something that is worth keeping in mind. While stirring up the yarn, I saw some evidence of what looks like some color breaking, especially in some of these red and blue mixtures where I see areas that look more purple and more pink, but we will see as time goes on. These aren't going to be perfect solids because there's not a ton of volume for the yarn to move around in. If we wanted something even more solid, we would have more volume and move things around a lot more. But I'm now going to cover all of these and we'll let them sit overnight or a couple of days or until all of the color in here has absorbed to the yarn. I have labeled each of the containers 1 through 15, so that way we will be able to put it back in the correct order, no matter what. And now we're going to set them aside in an out of, way, out of the way place. Or you could even place them outside, and since it's July and 90 degrees out there, uh, the heat from outside will also help the color start to absorb. I do plan to go ahead and steam set these once um, all that color has absorbed, but we'll be able to do it in smaller batches because uh, we have it set up like this. Now, if we were doing this in some kind of glass mason jar, I could go and take those and put them into a water bath directly to set them. But this type of setup is very easy to expand further with more and more and more samples and is very scalable. Whereas I have limited space in the pots on my stove. I checked on the yarn last night and most of the color absorbed pretty quickly with the yellow seeming to be probably the slowest, just from a rough estimation. Um, and this morning, about 24 hours later, the color is absolutely all in the yarn, so let's bring it in so we can go and set it. You can see the condensation on these lids, and the yarn is warm being outside, but there's no color left in the water of the yellow and the blue. And ooh, that red is beautiful at 1%, our red. Um, so now I'm gonna go ahead and remove all of the rest of the lids. Now I wanna steam set the colors, but I hope that this technique is showing you how scalable this is because we only have 15 samples here, but if you have enough cups, it would be easy to do, say, even 100. Um, with this method, easier than heating them one at a time in a big pot or something like that. As for these three colors in the middle, we'll need to see them dry, but you can tell a huge difference between them. They all lead, lean very warm. That red had a big influence, but one is more blue, more red, and more brown. And so now I'm going to take these minis or I suppose micro skeins, even though I refer to anything less than uh, 100 grams as a mini. I take these three skeins from the middle and I am attempting 
to keep them pretty well ordered. And these three I'm gonna to keep together um, with a removable nylon zip tie. I'm not worried about color transfer between these three, um, but I wanna keep them together because that way I will be able to put things back in the triangle at the end. And some other colors that I will probably group, I'll probably do these four, these four, then these four. I'm not sure if I'll fit all in one steamer basket, but you know, actually, let's steam them all at once. There is technically a tiny difference between these red and yellows, the red and yellow mixes, but it's super subtle. I'm now gonna take these 15 mini skeins and put them in, in my steamer basket and you can see our cleared containers. Some of them had a tiny bit of color around the lip that didn't absorb onto the yarn, but otherwise, all the color is in the yarn. And now, I will steam set this yarn. Oops, that's the wrong lid. But anyway, I will steam set this yarn uh, for 20 minutes. There's a chance we could see some color transfer at this stage, but if I was actually worried about that, then I probably would have steamed all the reds together and the yellow more separate, but the colors are really, really well set. If you open the containers and there's still some color in there, you can add more vinegar and let it sit even longer. Um, so there are options there, but I have found that I can get the color to clear even with more than a 1% depth of shade. And so I really like this cool vat type technique because it allows me to uh, play with more semi-solid colors really easily on a shorter time scale. I have finished steam setting the yarn and now we need to wait for it to cool to wash but at first glance I don't see any color transfer onto the yellow and honestly that's the color I would be the most worried about. But anyway, once the yarn cools, then we can wash it. I checked the yellow closely and I saw no evidence of color transfer. Uh, that's the place where it would be most obvious. And now we can wash the yarn. These colors are beautiful. Uh, and, you know, there's not as much of a range, but we weren't going for evenly distributed colors on our triangle. The goal is to understand how these three colors mix together so that way you can make decisions about how you might want to mix things more in the future. And now I'm going to add a little bit of some gusto to our wash. And there's still no bleeding. So I'm gonna rinse this to get this soap out. Then I'll put the yarn through my spin dryer and hang it up to dry. As we wait for the yarn to dry, there are a few other things that you can consider at this point. Uh, you can use these mini skeins as mini skeins in whatever project you want, or you can create recipe color cards with them and wind some amount on a little card with the recipe you used and the depth of shade so that way you have something to refer to as you plan colors in the future. A lot of dye companies have color swatches on their website and things like that but because of the way monitors and different fiber types pick, take up color, it's not as accurate as actually having a physically dyed sample. This isn't something that I do personally because I tend to more dye by feel than dye from recipes, but uh, if you want to produce reproducible colorways and if you want to plan new colorways, I think that having recipes on cards like this is a really amazing resource to have at your disposal. That way you aren't doing mixing troubleshooting all over again every time you want a specific green, but you only have yellow and blue in your stash. There are so many different ways that dyers organize this, and since, as I said, it's not something I do personally, I don't have an example to show you, but it is definitely worth considering. Here are all of the colors from our triangle exercise. We started with Jacquard Bright Yellow, Brilliant Blue, and Fire Red. And in all of the samples that we have here, we dyed the yarn at a 1% depth of shade, which means that there was a proportion of one gram of dye per 100 grams of yarn, even though we were only dyeing 10 gram mini skeins, so we had 0.1 grams of dye in each. And we achieved this small amount by making a stock solution and measuring out volumes of those stocks. 
if we expand our original primaries a little bit, we've got our secondary colors, which are a 50-50 mixture of any of the two primaries. The balance between the blue and the yellow is pretty good, but red is a lot more pigmented. And so some dyes have filler in them. So one gram of dye between many different colors might be extremely different. Like a black would have way more pigment than an ecru uh, and things like that. So that's important to consider when you are evaluating the colors. I wanted to show putting the rest of the colors in place so you could get a little better sense of the progression, especially since I think there's some colors that look pretty similar. Every single color here is distinct but these reds are so close. I mean, these three colors have just a really subtle progression and then all of a sudden that yellow really stands out. Uh, there's more balance here with the blue and the yellow, but I'd still say the blue definitely influences the tones a lot more. The blue and the red are more balanced than the red and the yellow, but uh, this color right here feels more like it should be a midpoint as a mixture between blue and red when really it has a lot more of the blue. And again, this is because of the proportions that we have. And we set this up so that way these three colors right here would be the 50-50 mix of the various hues. If we were to start with a less concentrated solution of red, then we might end up seeing a little more balance in the way that the mixtures are distributed. But that is something that I don't quite know the exact proportions of off the top of my head. What this exercise does allow us to do is understand how these three primaries mix together and then give you a good starting point for mixing the colors that you want. If you want a more yellow orange, you know you're gonna want a lot more yellow than three parts yellow to one part red because that is still a fairly red orange right there. This exercise is worth repeating, and I mentioned this before, but with a magenta, cyan, and yellow, or maybe with other reds and blues and yellows that you might have in your, in your stash. And this could absolutely vary between different brands, the exact hues you get from mixing. The three colors in the middle had two parts, this had two parts blue, two parts red, two parts yellow, and then one part each of the other two colors. I would say that this red leaning mixture and the same with the purple, they almost feel like you might mistakenly put them in that gradient between the red and the blue at the very bottom. Now that they're dry, it's a little easier to tell that they're a bit more muted, but that red absolutely dominates all of these mixtures. Even if we have one more, a little more burgundy, a little more brown, and a little more purple. I am so excited to have finally done this exercise, and I highly recommend that you do this for yourself. Sure, you can take that this triangle that I created and then start mixing from this. Uh, you have all the recipes that I used and it's reasonable for you to use it, but I still think that having done this exercise myself really was useful for helping me figure out the proportions between these three colors and giving me some hints to work with when I wanna go and mix things further. It's always fun to see the colors you create when we just started with three different colors. I happen to really like having access to premixed colors in my collection, but by starting with just red, yellow, and blue, there might be a few other colors I would recommend having in your collection. I would recommend a bright pink, a, a more magenta color, a cyan, a black, and then maybe a gray uh, and a good brown or navy. I think those colors are ones that are probably the ones that I would reach for the most and are some of the ones that I am most likely to have a stock solution already made up of in my own personal uh, stock collection. 
When you look at this closer, you can get a sense of where you might want to pull some other colors in. Um, because if I were to shift this down, some color changes feel more abrupt in here than others. I have already done some color mixing with some of the food coloring I have on hand, but uh, taking it further to get more mixes would be a really fun exercise. Is that something you would be interested in seeing? Let me know down in the comments below. Wasn't this fun? I typically feel very nervous when it comes to color mixing and having an innate sense of what kind of, where I should start with my recipes. And this was so helpful that I cannot wait to try this again with more dye types and maybe even on some different fiber contents. It's worth keeping in mind that the way colors absorb to a superwash wool blend might look different than 100% silk or some other fiber types. Uh, so you should take your recipes with a grain of salt when you consider different yarn bases and you might need to consider some additional testing. I haven't yet had the opportunity to unbox the first lesson for Dive Into Dying, and I'm hoping it's going to show up any day now. So make sure you're subscribed to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel and have your notifications turned on so that way you don't miss this unboxing. I am so, so excited. We have been working on this for a really, really long time, and I finally can talk about it and share it with all of you. And I'm really, really proud of the videos that I created uh, for Knit Crate's YouTube channel, and so I am not quite sure when those will be up, but hopefully soon. But anyway, since there's still some details I don't yet know about the Dive Into Dying course, I will include some of them down in the video description, plus a link that's an affiliate link to Knit Crate. Uh, and I always have lots of helpful links down in my description, so it's always worth going and checking those out. If you love these Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube videos and want to help support the channel, I do have a Patreon where I offer some exclusive behind the scenes sneak peeks, early access to the Dipot PS series and more. Uh, there will also be a link to that down in the video description. I love to try different techniques and things for the first time on camera, no matter how nervous I am. And I think that it's helpful because that way we can all learn together from my mistakes and successes. And I'm constantly being inspired and you, I guess you get to see how I react the very first time I try something. And I'm not very good at hiding how I feel about things. And so I think when I'm really excited about something, it's pretty apparent. And I am very excited about uh, this technique. And I'm really excited that Knit Crate thought that they should include this in the course. And I mean, I can't believe that I haven't tried it before right now. And so it just shows that after years and years of dyeing yarn and exploring techniques, we all still have something that we can learn. And well, I hope that I never stop learning. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and thank you so much for watching.